Hi, uh, I'm Alex, and together with Shiv and Pranav and Hannah, we developed the assignments for this course. So we're just going to briefly uh, talk about each of them. So just a brief overview, our goal was to develop five assignments covering various aspects of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. For instance, the second assignment uh, covers a, a consensus protocol that's more similar to Ripple than to Bitcoin. Um, so first we had to design each of them, come up with the modules that we wanted to make, figure out where to draw the boundary between what we would provide and what the students would implement. Um, after we, uh, we did the development work, we developed them all in Java. Um, and then we also developed automated testing code in Java so that uh, when submissions are entered into Dropbox, you can click a button and see some tests run against your code to get some, some output. Yeah. This just probably explains that Dropbox is the system we have at Princeton and not uh, <laughs> for people listening online, not the thing that might be useful. Yes, uh, so we, we have this system that we call Dropbox, but uh, it's simply a way that, that we can submit files to our own servers. Um, and when, when students submit, there's a button that says check all submitted files, um, which then behind the scenes runs some Java code against the submitted code and then uh, prints some messages showing if you've passed all the tests or which tests you haven't passed. Um, yes? I have a question. So you said first work in the core, right? Yeah, I'm going to mention that in a oh, second. Okay, sure. um, so, so of, of course, the assignments were for this semester's course. Uh, they're also going to be used in an upcoming cryptocurrency uh, massive open online course. And uh, for the fifth assignment, uh, we've been developing a variation on the fifth assignment, which I'll go into a little more detail about on the last slide, uh, which will be used in next semester's offering of interacting with data. They wanted to do an assignment uh, related to Bitcoin, so we came up with something for that. Thanks. Uh, the first assignment was called Scrooge Coin. This was based uh, off a model that we saw in class. Before we, we got to Bitcoin, we saw an introductory model called Scrooge Coin, in which instead of a decentralized network for verifying payments, there's a centralized entity called Scrooge who manages the transaction ledger. Scrooge verifies transactions, gets to decide which ones to include, which ones not to include. Uh, so the, the project was to implement a function that receives a set of transactions and determines a maximal mutually valid subset. What do I mean by that? Well, first each transaction in the subset has to be valid in and of itself, in the sense that all the signatures have to be valid. The output amounts have to be non-negative. Uh, the transaction fee has to be non-negative. In other words, the sum of the output amounts has to be at most the sum of the input amounts. It wouldn't make sense otherwise. Uh, but furthermore, make sure that there aren't any double spends or triple spends or more than that spends. Um, and, and the way that we, we uh, modeled this is that at a given point in time, there is uh, what we call a UTXO set, some set of outstanding uh, unspent transaction outputs. And from this set of transactions that are received, they're allowed to spend both from that UTXO set and potentially from each other. So you have to consider some iterative algorithm for figuring out how to, how to create a set of transactions which together are valid, which don't spend any UTXO either from the initial set or created by transactions in, in the set that you're processing more than once. Now, of course, an empty set would satisfy these conditions. So to make it a bit more interesting, you want your set to be maximal in the sense that you can't enlarge it simply by adding more transactions to the set. Now, a harder question is to find a maximum one, one that, uh, for which there is no larger set satisfying these conditions. Uh, this is NP hard, but we gave a variation on this as extra credit in which you have to find a subset which has maximum total transaction fees. Now, you know, we, we assume that there's no polynomial time algorithm for doing this, um, but with the, the small the data sets that we had and with some heuristics, you could come up with algorithms for doing this. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Pranav. Right, so for assignment two, we studied consensus. Uh, during class, we talked about Ripple as being one example of a payment system where the premise is on consensus. So you have this network, which we call a trust graph, and within the graph, every node sets up trust relationships of which other nodes it trusts and which other nodes it's communicating to. So in this assignment, which you're all familiar with, uh, the students implemented a compliant node, which is running their uh, large fraction of the nodes in the network are running the compliant node code that the students write. And along with these compliant nodes, there are also malicious nodes that are running on the same ne network. And the malicious nodes can have a variety of strategies. So at the very basic ones, they could just be, so to speak, dead, meaning that they don't actually communicate or propose other transactions to nodes or verify anything. Uh, on the opposite extreme, they could be sort of very clever and try to selectively release transactions and trick other nodes into believing that they are not malicious. 
So the point is that at every round, there's a sequence where every node proposes transactions to other nodes, and then every node has to make a decision on whether or not to accept that transaction. And at the very end of uh, the protocol, so after either 10 or 20 rounds, every compliant node will be queried for which transactions it believes uh, everyone has reached consensus on. At a very bare minimum, the compliant nodes should all agree exactly on which uh, transactions it believes consensus has been reached upon. And going beyond that, the next priority is to maximize that set. So you can't just output that there are zero transactions. You have to have a fairly large set of uh, transactions that everyone outputs at the very end. Um, so the very basic algorithm for this is sort of a threshold based where every node just uh, checks how many of its neighbors that it trusts are proposing this. And as soon as it reaches this moving threshold, you start including it. But we were glad to see that students, uh, you all came up with more clever solutions as well. Um, in particular, because all the compliant nodes were running the same code, a lot of students sort of encoded some sort of behavior that keys compliant nodes to each other's existence. And that's how a lot of students uh, ended up implementing this, which was sort of in a real scenario, a malicious node could be adapted and catch that, but it was still within the specification of this assignment. And in general, everyone did pretty well. There's a wide range, actually. There's one uh, submission that didn't compile, but on the other hand, there's um, Sahil, Andy, and Hanson passed all the tests, which was really cool. Uh, and everyone else did pretty well, except for the very devious test cases where every transaction originated in just one node. Okay, so uh, the third assignment which we developed for the course was uh, blockchain. Uh, so this was an extension to assignment one where we had the screws coin, just that we went closer to the actual Bitcoin model. And in this assignment, students had to implement a blockchain data structure. And uh, the critical part was that this blockchain data structure is not just a list of blocks which have been mined. It's, it's, it should be capable of handling both soft and hard folks in the network. And uh, so we wanted students to uh, implement the default mining strategy, which is implemented by the reference Bitcoin client, which is uh, the miner mining on the top of the current highest block in the blockchain. Uh, the critical part of the assignment was though that since the blockchain is a very huge, very huge data structure, as in if you consider all the blocks mined since the beginning of uh, Bitcoin, it's not possible to to have all the blocks in the memory at a certain point of time. So students need to have a small proportion of the blockchain in the memory, but they still need to take care of things like double spends and all, because a block which is mined in say 2015 might use a certain UTXO, which was generated by a transaction back in 2010, or maybe UTXO uh, generated by the transaction in the Genesis block. So uh, there are a couple, or there are a lot of clever ways of doing that, and students came up with a different with different solutions. But mostly, the solution rotated about uh, making a certain kind of tree data structure for blockchains. Uh, so having implemented the blockchain, we uh, the students uh, implemented three basic functionalities and they were like uh, receiving transactions from the network, receiving blocks from other miners, and mining uh, one's own block. So this was assignment three, and uh, uh, the assignment four is a very interesting assignment. It, it basically involves some kind of game theory in which uh, students develop their own miner, and uh, uh, the, the approach is they have to maximize their profit in a network of miners, in a network in which there can be many deviant miners. By deviant, I mean that they are not implementing the reference uh, mining strategy, and they might be implementing some of the most Bitcoin attacks which we have seen. Uh, for example, selfish mining, feather forking, or some kind of blacklisting based on some criteria. So uh, we implemented some of these deviant mining strategies, and then uh, we created a simulation kind of network in which we had different block delegates. We, we tried to implement the actual uh, network in, in our simulation and uh, uh, s given different kind of simulation settings, given different kind of scenarios, for example, there is a selfish miner with say 50% hash rate distribution and there is a feather folk miner with 25% hash rate distribution and the rest uh, hash rate belongs to the student miner. What kind of strategy should the student take in order to maximize the profit? So given these different uh, scenarios uh, given to the student at runtime, student, the student miner has to devise a strategy for maximizing the profit. So. Yeah, so this was uh, more or less the assignment number four. 
and assignment number five, and it's just more about that. Assignment number five is uh, not a development assignment, really, in the sense that the other ones were. It's more of a, a data analysis assignment. Um, so it's called transaction graph analysis. Here, the data that, that students are given is the blockchain, the entire blockchain, or well, cutting it off at some point. Um, and the task is to use this data to answer various questions. Here are some examples. What percent of Bitcoin wealth is held by the wealthiest 1% of addresses? Which addresses do you think are controlled by the same real world entity as some given address? Um, approximately what fraction of blocks contain a Coinbase transaction that identifies the miner of that block? So goals are to, to come up with different techniques for trying to answer these. For instance, the second one can, can be analyzed by using clustering algorithms similar to the ones discussed in a prior presentation from the Fistful of Bitcoins paper. Um, and we've, we've composed a list of maybe 20 or so questions and we're still coming up with more. Um, there's also a related assignment, as I mentioned before, which will be used next semester for interacting with data. In this one, students are also given the blockchain, but sort of a more simplified version that cuts out some pieces that aren't, uh, aren't so relevant to the assignment, and are given a list of maybe a few thousand pairs of Bitcoin addresses. So each element will be a pair of, of addresses such as this. Um, and the, they're only given data up to time t, and the goal is to use that data to, uh, to cluster the addresses and to try to predict which of these pairs will be joined in a transaction after time t, which of them will appear as, uh, as inputs to the same transaction after time t. Um, and of course, we'll pick pairs that maybe didn't appear as inputs to the same transaction before, but perhaps there's some chain linking them, or perhaps one was a change address of a transaction that had the other one as an input. And uh, the goal is for students to learn about these, these clustering algorithms and to apply them uh, to analyze this data. And that's it. Thank you.